Amen, amen. Uh, while we're standing, we're just going to read one verse out of Psalms 11, verse number 5. Psalms 11, verse number 5. It states, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Now, our text actually is those first five words. The Lord trieth the righteous. The Lord trieth the righteous. Amen. God bless you so much. You may be seated. Amen. I'm going to give you the uh, title of what I want to talk about today. And um, we've every now and then we state make a statement that some things can be taught, um, projected out, and then some things they really have to be caught. They they just they just we have to catch it. And um, if we don't catch it, then it just flies by us, etc. But um, we know that God wants to use people. He wants to use people. The reason that that he saves anybody, first and foremost, he loves them. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Jesus Christ said, I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. So first and foremost, whether it be in that dispensation, the thief on the cross, who would never... Um, visit one church pew, per se. He would never pass out one track. He'd never teach a Bible study. He would never put in a dime towards any building project or anything for the kingdom that way. He just wanted to save him, and the man was willing and desirous to be saved. So that's first and foremost. But secondly, not only does he want to save us, he does want to use us. He wants to use us. He saves us for a purpose. This is why in the parables repeated throughout the four Gospels, he will save individuals, speaking of people to which he distributed talents. And talents were amounts of uh, money in those days. And uh, we use the word talent as abilities. And, and they're not, the words are not counter one to the other. He gives us each of us are some several talents or several abilities. And, um, and he wants to see produce. He wants to use us. He would like for five talent people to bring forth ten and two to bring forth five and etc. So he wants to, to use his people. So here's the title that I want to talk to us about that God wants to use and not lose people. He wants to use and not lose people. So when he saves us because he loves us, then he does want to use us in the process of using us. He does not want to lose us. So part of the processes and part of the wisdom of God in his dealings with people is found in these five words. The Lord trieth the righteous. He, he, he tries us. He examines us. He, 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 um, he, he wants, he knows what's in us, but he wants to know it by way of watching it play out. But it's important that we know ourselves. NIV puts this, the Lord examines the righteous. TM, he tests. The good. Uh, NCV, the Lord tests those who do right. Young's literal, Jehovah the righteous doth try, amplified. The Lord tests and proves the unyieldingly righteous. Amen. So, so it's like there are uh, testing grounds. We call them trials that that we begin to go through as we live for God. Not all of life, by no means, is a trial. Living for God is the greatest blessing on earth. In the midst of it, though, 
Some days are better than others. Some situations are better than others. And there are things that arise that try our hearts, that, that we have to wade through, that we have to go through. We have to set our teeth. We have to go to our knees and pray. We have to, we have to uh, um, strive hard to keep our heart, mind, soul correct. We have to continue to think right, to feel right to act right, to be right, in spite of a natural man, fallen propensity, that would maybe want to do something otherwise than what is right. So there are seasons that he does that. And um, it's, it's, it's Job was a blessing to the kingdom of God, but then the great, great trial of Job came, uh, we won't, we'll just quickly rehearse. He loses sons and daughters. He loses, um, vast hosts of servants. He loses his flocks, his herds, his camels, oxen, asses. He, he loses it all. He loses the health of his body. He loses his friends. He loses apparently the goodwill of his wife. And then he loses the ability to even feel or find God. Now that's a trial. That's a trial. Some of you may have been upset because someone took your parking spot this morning. But I'm going to tell you, that's a trial, what Job went through. And, uh, and, and yet God blessed him and used him. When he came through, he ended up with twice as much. He would go on to live another 140 years. He would see his children's children's children children and uh, and I believe that his latter half of his life God used him vastly more than he did prior to his trial because now he had the experience of his trial how many people do you suppose he helped in the next 140 years that lost a loved one or suffered a setback I want you to know Job became the guiding star of loss and yet God bringing it back. And how many people down through the millenniums have leaned on Job. So God used Job, but in the process of using him, he certainly did not want to lose him. Amen. And so God wants to use in varying degrees all of us. And so he... He, he tries, he examines the righteous, amen. He, he, he has things that, that happen with us. Now, again, ultimately, here's what God really wants for every one of us. And this is found in Ephesians 3. Uh, did we by any chance back there find those notes from a couple of weeks ago? I sent Leah a text. Don't worry about it. Things get lost in the shuffles of life, praise God. Uh, Ephesians 3.16 says that he would grant you, this is what he really wants for each of us, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Here's what God wants to bring to pass in our lives that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now that's huge, and that's what God wants for all of us. He goes on in verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. When you, that is, that is sublime. That is, the first three chapters of Ephesians are mind boggling. And that portion right there is, and that, when he saved us, he has this in mind. And if you'll think about this, in the Old Testament, even pre-law dispensation in which Job lived, God used him 
to those scriptures to a vast degree. There's a lot, of course, about God in Christ that he did not know, but he knew God. And, and, and so he was used to the maximum of his God-given abilities in the latter portion of his life, more than the first portion of his life, because of his trial that he went through. And so God wants to use us, that we can comprehend the breadth, length, depth, height, the love of Christ, amen, so that we can shine in this generation. So, amen, in order to get from A to B, B to C, C to D, sometimes there are these trials and temptations that come upon us. But in 1 Corinthians 10, please keep this in mind. This is huge. Verse 13. First Corinthians. Ah, we did find them. We found the notes. All right. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So whatever comes your way, don't feel like, oh no, I'm singled out. Nobody's ever gone through what I'm going through. Nobody's ever faced what I'm facing. Nobody's ever felt what I'm feeling. Truth is, everybody in some, we all drink from the cup and the cups. He says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above your able, but with, but will, with the temptation, make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. TM puts it on this wise, no test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He will never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. And so there are days when we think, God, you got more confidence in me than I do, is all I can tell you. Now, what if in the course of a trial, a test, temptation, whatever, you say, but I didn't pass. I didn't pass the test. Well, if we were going to say, everybody raise your hand that has failed a test since you've lived for God. And if you raise your hand, then you go home and quit living for God because it's over. And that was to go be broadcast throughout all of Christendom, amen, of one God, Jesus, name apostolics throughout the world. The church would be empty today. Okay? He does not, it's like your kids... I thought I told you to take out the trash. Oh, man. Ah. Okay, well, listen, pack your bags. And um, there's an orphanage down the road. Go, because you're no longer my son or my daughter. You didn't, you didn't pass the test. That's not a very good parent. Well, God is faithful. Okay? And so he wants us to learn. Proverbs 24, 16 is an amazing verse. It says, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. People can mess up, but if they're righteous, they'll get back up, amen, taking him by the hand in humble repentance, and they'll keep going forward. Amen. The complete Jewish Bible says, though he falls seven times, he will get up again. It's the wicked who fall under stress, who fail under stress. Amen. So there's got to be something in us that says, I'm going to keep taking that test till I pass it. I'm going to keep taking that test till I pass it. I'm going to keep taking that test till I pass it. And God is good that way. Amen. Uh, people that have been in the military when they're in the process of being made a fighting man. In the process, uh, I, I was not in the military. I tried to get into <laughs> to the military when I was uh, 18. We were in the middle of the Vietnam War, and I tried to join them. I talked to four of my buddies into joining the Army with me, and they all they all went, they went to Germany or Vietnam, my police record was so bad I couldn't get in. Now that's pretty bad. You can't even get in the army in time of war. But my my uh, my record was too bad to get into the army. 
so I didn't go into the army. But, you know, I know the, 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 the stories, and there are many uh, veterans here, that, that when, when you start with boot camp until you're a finished product, and there are men under the sound of my voice that you have fought in war, that to go from that, that, that lanky, skinny kid to a machine out there fighting for the United States, uh, there's a lot of trial and error. And a new recruit makes more mistakes than he gets things right. And they have drill sergeants that are more than happy to point out how stupid they are, how inept they are. And, and are your parents ashamed of you? And I mean, just, just on and on and on because, because, but they eventually make a military individual out of them. If they've got it in them, they'll, they'll bring it out. No, I'm glad God doesn't do that way. You stupid idiot. Why did I even go to Calvary for you? If I'd have known what a loser you were, I'd have just stayed in heaven. And on and on and on. Thank God he don't go there. He's faithful. He's righteous. He's good. Amen. He'll pick us up seven times. He'll just keep helping us. Keep helping us. Now, back in World War II, the British... Especially up until December 7th, 41. Well, actually, until um, Hitler invaded Russia after France fell. Britain was all alone in the whole world. And um, um, the British, some people say the British won World War II because if Churchill would have folded when they were all alone, then, then Hitler would have been free to run amok. So that's very true. That, that they served their role and that they did not give up at a unbelievable time of test and trial. Others say the United States won World War II because of the, we, we lost less men than did Britain and by far Russia because of our uh, industrial might and the amount of ships that we were able to put out to sea. Uh, even Henry Kaiser, had Kaiser still out here, they got to where they were putting out major shipping destroyers. Uh, they were putting them out uh, at, at one point every 60 days. This one plant was putting out and had plants all over the nation. By the end of the war, the amount of planes and ships that the Americans were putting out was unbelievable. And the tanks that fed the Russian armies and the British armies, and so they say it was the industrial might of America that won World War II. The Russians say, no, we won World War II because four out of five Germans that died, died on the Russian planes. Four out of five Germans that died in World War II, they died in Russia. So each nation played their role to win. As time went on, the British, uh, they, they served gallantly, but they didn't have the manpower Russia did, and they certainly didn't have the industrial power that America did. So one of the things, though, that Russia, I mean, that Great Britain did, that not much has been talked about it, was that they worked and wormed their way throughout Europe, creating what we call guerrilla tactics and subterfuge, and uh, some of the things they did covertly was vast and unbelievable. In, in, in the breaking of codes, both the Japanese and the, and the uh, German codes, and they arrayed an army of unbelievable, colorful characters, a cast of characters that went through uh, Nazi German-occupied countries. And the subterfuges and the, from things being blowed up were just mind-boggling what the British could do. And I'm just going to tell you one story here. He's, uh, when Czechoslovakia fell, uh, 1,500 military people were all they could manage to evacuate. So there was 1,500 about military men in Great Britain. They needed... Two Czechoslovakian people. 
uh, there was a colonel, Czechoslovakian colonel named Moravec, and, and, and they were approached. And so they started going through, they needed two men. And they worked with every one of the 1,500 men because they had a very special job, something that must be done in Czechoslovakia. So they began filtering through all these men. Who's able to accomplish this? And so they began to pepper each and every one with literally hundreds of questions to find out their mental abilities, their psyche, their outlooks. And the final last question for every single one of them was, are you willing to die for your country? So of those that said yes, then they were taken aside. And they passed the mental test and then they were willing to die for their country. Then they were subjected. There was a guy named Sykes that took them over. And they were subjected to the most unbelievable, severe, physical, mental, emotional training for six weeks, solid. Days upon days without sleep, very little if any food, physical traumas, trials that broke many of them down. They were pushed, amen, to the extreme limits of psychological stress, emotional, physical trauma. And so more and more and more, they simply... They had to drop out. They, 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 they couldn't do it. Those that remained were trained in jiu-jitsu, markmanship, hand-to-hand combat. They had to learn how to live on sub- synthetic food. Again, sleeplessness. They had to get to where they could throw hand grenades into baskets from great distances, bomb throwing, even when the bomb was about to go off in their hands. Um, they would have to learn how to fight. They would come in. Absolutely, utterly, totally exhausted from a day. And there, before they could go to their bunks, they would be met with several strong, well-rested men that would attack them. They're utterly exhausted. Now they're being attacked by several strong, and they'd have to fight their way out from those men. Out of the 1,500 checks, there were only two men left that made it. But all they needed was two. And one's name was Joseph, Yusuf Gabcek and Jan Kubis. Now Gabcek was a small man. He was given to rages of temper. Unbelievably tough. He had been orphaned from a small child. He was full of anger. He was full of fury. But he had a redeeming factor. That when he'd lose his temper in the middle of a tirade... He could realize how stupid he was and how stupid he was behaving and on a dime turn and start laughing at himself and calm down. He realized, I'm such an idiot, and start laughing and sit down. Kubris was the opposite type of person. He was a perfect counterfoil to Grabchik. He was a very shy, soft-spoken man who never lost his temper, and yet the two meshed together and worked perfectly. Now, two totally different characters. And I'm just going to stop here and make a statement. God has a host of characters. And it's amazing to me to watch how he uses so many different people with so many different characteristics. And so you can be a Gabcheck, amen, or uh, a, a... uh, Kubris, totally different, and yet, and yet be both used. So this British man that talked them was named Sykes. People thought he was a sadist. They thought he was cruel. People after the war that knew him said he was one of the kindest, sweetest men you ever want to meet in life if you're just sitting down talking with him. The reason that he come across so rough on people that he trained was because he was doing he seemed to have an absence of feelings and compassion well the truth of the matter was he was dying and crying on the inside because before he died he said all I was trying to do was keep men from being needlessly killed all I wanted was for them to be ready so they wouldn't die needlessly 
So he'd step up to the plate and do what was contrary to his nature. And uh, they say the stress of the war actually is what killed him. So Sykes and his treatment of them was their best chance of living through the job they were planning for them. They had to pass all the testings. What they were supposed to do, and they did, was on June 4th, 1942, they killed a Nazi SS general named Reinhard Tristan Eugen Heydrich, Reinhard Heydrich, who was the main architect of the Holocaust. Many World War II historians regard him as the darkest figure within the Nazi elite. And Adolf Hitler described him as the man with the iron heart. And they killed him. They assassinated him. Later, Czechoslovakian turncoats turned them in. And in retaliation, there were so many Czechs killed in anger by the Nazis because of the death of Heydrich. For a while, they thought maybe they'd made a mistake in killing him. Until they realized that he had probably, in the killing uh, Heydrich, God only knows how many Jews were actually saved. And along with that, they said once... If Heydrich would have been alive when, when Hitler began to lose it, Heydrich had such a name they felt like Heydrich probably would have been lifted up by the fellow generals to replace Hitler. And he did not have Hitler's weaknesses. And he would have actually ended up being far more diabolical than Hitler had. This is the belief of many, many people. So he had to be taken out, and those two men faced unbelievably hellish tests and trials until they could handle it all. And they did their job, and they did indeed end up, because of a traitor, dying for their country. Can I, can I tell you this? that the kingdom we're fighting for is far more important than anything going on in this world. We are fighting for an eternal kingdom. And I'm working on a message, and brothers and sisters, we're living in a crazy world that's got a lot of crazy nations, and and in its own many multiple ways, and I love America. I'd rather live here than anywhere else. America is getting crazier all the time. And listen to me, we ain't seen nothing yet. Having said that, one of my biggest, sweetest, greatest comforts is I love being an American citizen, but it's not my number one citizenship. You hear me? We are citizens of the kingdom of God. We are kings and priests. And our obligations to this kingdom are far higher and they are eternal. Amen. And so... What we're doing has eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. And so the things that we do and go through and face and, 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 and that happen, amen, everything serves a purpose. All things work to the good, to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. You, if you, when you become a, a U.S. military man, literally... You become government property. That's true. You are government property. If you, if you blow up a Jeep, you have destroyed government property. Well, if you mess yourself up, you have messed up government property. You can be in trouble for getting in a fight and messing up your face because you, sir, are government property. And, 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 and so they own you. Well, we're bought with a price. Hallelujah. We belong to him. We're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Hallelujah. He said, you want to know who my mother and father and sister, not not my father. You want to know who my mother and brothers and sisters are? Amen. They that hear the word of God and keep it. We're part of the family of God. Amen. This is just, I'm working on a lot of stuff, but isn't that something when Jesus resurrected and the angels met the Marys at the tomb and and they say he's not here, he's risen. And they are running and they're on their way to the disciples. And there, on the way, they meet Jesus. The disciples ran and fled. 
They're now in a room, holed up, licking their mental, emotional wounds. Nobody, the closest, John was at the foot of the cross. Peter denied him with a curse. Everybody else fled for their lives. Jesus now is appearing to those women on the way to the disciples. He could have said, go tell my servants. Go tell them the king of kings is coming. Go tell them. He could have said all. But you know what he said? He said, listen close. He said, go tell my brethren. He was not ashamed to be called their brethren. Jesus is your brother. He's our king. Our Savior, our friend that sticks closer than a brother. We're part of the family of God. Amen. This is, I'm, I'm looking at special forces and we're part of the kingdom. And so, and so the things that we go through, it's because we're, we're part of the citizens of another country and, and the Lord's working. Now we talked about Job. Let's think about Job just for a moment. Okay, when Job faced his trial, his great, great trial, do you think that was the first trial he ever faced? That was the only trial of that scale. But he had been tried many a time. Before God said to Satan, where you been? Up and down, to and fro throughout the earth. Before God ever said, have you considered my servant Job? God had considered him many a time. He knew what he was doing. He's basically issuing a challenge. Have you considered him a perfect man, upright, fears God, hates evil? And all the angelic hosts are looking. Devil, you couldn't live for God in heaven. And there's a man on earth named Job that fears God, hates you perfect, upright. The challenge is made. He said, you let me touch him. You got a hedge about him. I'll get him to cuss you to your face. And we know the story. He comes back. The man's lost everything. Well, where you been? Up, down, to, fro. Well, if you consider Job perfect, upright, fears God, hates evil. P.S. He knows how to hold fast his integrity. You don't, but he does. Skin for skin, a man. And so it goes back and forth. And here is Job's great trial. But God knew I can use Job and I won't lose him because he'd already tested him. He'd been on the firing lines. There's just something about it. Now, was Job perfect? Notice this, Job 13 and 26. He makes this statement to his friends. For thou writest bitter things against me and makest me to possess, listen, make me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Job is bringing up, no, nobody else, Job is bringing up, when I was a kid, I made some dumb mistakes. When I was young, New Living says, you write bitter accusations against me and bring up all the sins of my youth. TM, you compile a long list of mean things about me, even hold me accountable for the sins of my youth. So yes, Job had made some mistakes, but he knew how to repent and pick himself up and pick himself up and keep going. And God knew, I'm forming him, I'm molding him, I'm making him, I can trust him. He's been through trials. Notice this. This gets pretty interesting. Psalms 25, 7. David says, remember not the sins of my youth nor my transgressions according to thy mercy's sake, O Lord. Verse eleven twenty five. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. David is learning stuff about himself. Verse 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall God teach in the way that he shall choose. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to skip verse 30 and just, and just, and just move on down. Even Jeremiah. And notice this in verse 31, 19. Jeremiah says, Surely after that I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. 
Taylor puts it this way. I turned away from God, but I was sorry afterwards. I kicked myself for my stupidity. I was thoroughly ashamed of all I did in my younger days. So here's the great men of David, Jeremiah, Job. And we could go on and on and on that, that, that they would rise up and say, I've learned from my mistakes. I'm going forward. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. Hallelujah. One thing about it. Listen closely. To those of you, now, what I'm teaching today, I noticed that Pastor Booker was teaching last week. He said, I'm going to teach this again when all the young people are in here. I thought, that's very good because they need to hear it too. And so somewhere down the road, you will hear this again. Only the young people will, younger people will be here. By the time I get to it, they may be (laughs) much older. But everybody needs to hear it. And the youth need to hear it. Amen. The youth that are sitting there looking at themselves thinking, I am the village idiot. What am I doing trying to live for God? Can I tell us this older adult class, all of us can look at the youth and say, Hey, village idiot, I want you to meet another village idiot. Praise God. Guess what? If I made it, you can too. If I hung in there, baby, you can hang in there too. If God helped me, he'll help you. Hallelujah. I'm here to help you because I've been where you're at. And like old brother Terry used to tell me when I'd be getting on to my boys, Booker, my dad used to tell me, Ike, if I ever forgot I was a boy, I'd sure make it hard on you. So we look back and say, God, you're the keeper. You're the healer. You're the fixer. You're the redeemer. You're our brother. Hallelujah. You're our strength. You are, you are the ones that lift us up and strengthen us and put our feet. Amen. You plant our feet. You make us strong and we can continue to go forward in God's army. Being what God wants us to be. Hallelujah. There are many verses. I'm just going to give them to you quickly. 1 Kings 8, 46, there's no man that sinneth not. Ecclesiastes 7, 20, there's not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 12, whereas by one man sin and entered into the world, death by sin, so death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned. Amen. Everybody is going to throw their crown at his feet because they know. Hallelujah. This doesn't mean in spite of mistakes that we cannot be reclaimed, washed, redeemed, made strong. And listen to me. Used of God. 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 Amen. Tuesday night up up north I'm going to be talking to a group of people in... um, They've been in and out of jail. There's drug problems. There's all kinds of things. And, uh, and I'm going to talk to them about, look, basically, if God saved me, he can save anybody. I don't know if you know this, but Sister Booker here several months ago, Philip had her talk to all of the, the bus kids. My wife went and talked to all the bus kids. Now, these bus kids, they, they, they're for some rough backgrounds. You hear me? And they're sitting back there. This little old lady up there in her nice dress, and she's going to talk to us. And, <laughs> and she gets up, and she starts talking about her brutal, bestial, cruel, beating, giving, alcoholic father, and his tirades, and tearing up of houses to pieces, and little kids crying. Her mama not living for God. Daddy like that. The terror. And these kids are sitting up now. Many of them are starting to lean forward. And they're thinking in their mind. Some of them told Philip later, we just thought she was a sweet old lady. We didn't know anybody went through what we go through. We thought we're the only ones had to live that way. And here was a lady, amen, Bishop's wife, that was raised in the same hell holes that they're being raised in. And if God can keep her, he can keep them. If God could help her, he can help them. And those kids were blown away. When I think of the testimonies that are in this house, 
of God's grace and God's keeping power and what he can do. Hallelujah. It is amazing. Now, when Gabcek and Kubris went into Czechoslovakia, there were 498 Czechoslovakians still left in England. Listen to me. Every one of them was still valuable to their nation. Just because they didn't take out Heydrich didn't mean they were not valuable. Everybody has a place and a time and a season and a purpose. And so it is that every one of us, there's things we can bring to the kingdom. God wants, there's certain times and places. Joseph that saved his house. Amen. Joseph who had ten older brothers that hated him. Joseph that, 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 that was cast into a pit. And, and when the brethren are on the other side of the hill eating lunch, wondering what they're going to, if they're going to sell him or not, here come the Midianites. They take him out. They sell him to the Ishmaelites. They take him out. The Ishmaelites sell him to the, to the Egyptians. The Egyptians sell him to Potter, Potiphar. And, and, and so when they come back, he's gone. They don't know where he is. Joseph thinks they sold him because that's the last he heard them talking. They wanted to, and many times through Scripture it says they did because it was in their heart to do it. They were guilty. They just didn't get the chance. And, and, and so, but technically, they didn't know if he was alive or dead. They didn't know what ever happened to him. If they'd have sold him to the Midianites, they could have went to the Midianites and said, Hey, that guy we sold you X number of years ago, what would you ever do with him? Well, we sold him to the Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites well, what'd you, well, we sold him to the... But they couldn't. They didn't know where to start. They had no idea. Can I just tell you something? Joseph went from trial to trial, situation to situation, testing to testing. He ended up in, in, in the Egyptian prison. That wasn't the first time he had a trial in his life. God only knows what all the boy went through. But God was preparing him for the day he would be raised up to be such a type of Christ. He would save his household. In Daniel 1 and 8, notice this. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Notice verse 17, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Daniel, by the time he got into Nebuchadnezzar's training ground, he'd already purposed, I will not defile myself with the king's meat and the king's wine that has been offered to the king's God. All the other Israelites were doing it. He determined he would not. He was a product of King Josiah's revival. This was not the first trial he'd ever been through. But he was ready to stand. And when he stood, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego stood with him. And then these men, these four men, became the voice of God to that generation and into the ears of King Nebuchadnezzar. God gives them learning, wisdom, understanding, in visions and dreams. Verse 19 through 21. And the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king in all matters of wisdom, understanding. And the king inquired of them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. How valuable were these boys? How valuable were they after their trials and traumas and testings? Amen. How valuable, how valuable. Amen. Please note this. In 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. The Apostle Paul makes this statement. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Everybody say sinners. Sinners. 
Then he said, of whom I am chief. Hallelujah. He came to save us. He says in verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him unto life everlasting. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. The Apostle Paul understood that he felt like he was the chief sinner. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. But he was also becoming the apostle to the Gentiles. He would write, if he wrote Hebrews, over half the New Testament books. And that all after that would believe on Christ Jesus down through these last two millennia. They would look at Paul's life more than any other life except Jesus to learn about how to live for Jesus. So he said, he made me a pattern to everybody. So everything Paul went through, we are the recipients of that. He is key figure, not the key, but he is a key figure. The same apostle, at one time there was a man named John Mark. He was Barnabas' nephew. They were out on their first missionary journey to what is today the nation of Turkey. And they got to a certain place. I think it was Derby. Be that as it may, John Mark went back. He went back. He left Barnabas and Paul on their first missionary journey. When this years later and they're ready to go on the second missionary journey, Barnabas says, I'll get John Mark. And Paul said, you're not taking him. Well, he's a great kid. He left on the first journey. Well, he's just a kid. I don't care what he was. He left. He's not going. And the Bible said the contention was so great between them that the greatest missionary journey, or journey, greatest missionary couple that we've ever seen, Paul and Barnabas, broke up. And Barnabas takes John Mark under his wing. And Paul takes Silas under his, and they go out for the second missionary journey. But the years come and go. And what happens is, years later, Paul's in a prison. And he writes to his son in the gospel, Timothy, that he won on that first missionary journey in Lystra. And he says, bring John Mark. He's profitable to me for the gospel. The things John Mark learned through successes and failures made him profitable. Hallelujah. God wants to use people, not lose them. He wants to use us, not lose us. Let's stand. Musicians, come. What I'm about to give you as I close is not religious. But it's something to think about. There's an American. He's been voted time and again the most important president that's ever lived. Sometimes Washington beats him most of the time. And when he was on his way to leave Springfield, Missouri, he said, I'm going to face the greatest trial since George Washington. His name was Abraham Lincoln. He kept the United States United. But in 1831, he lost a job that he had. In 1832, he was defeated in a run for the Illinois State Legislature. He lost. 1833, he started and failed in business. In 1834, he finally had a success. He was elected to the Illinois State Legislature. The next year... A girl that apparently he really did love died. In 1836, he had a nervous breakdown. 1838, he was defeated in his run for the Illinois House Speaker. In 1843, he was defeated in his run for a nomination to the U.S. Congress. In 1846, he finally was elected to Congress. Thank God he finally had a success. Two years later, he lost the renomination. 1849, he was rejected for land officer position 
1854, he was defeated in a run for the U.S. Senate. 1856, he was defeated for a nomination for vice president. 1858, he was defeated again in a run for the United States Senate. This man does not have a good track record. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president. What did he carry into office? Not nearly as many successes as he had failures. But listen, we tend to learn from our failures better than we do our successes. And there's something about this kingdom and something about this God. I'm not looking at one loser out here. I'm not looking at one loser. You don't, I don't care where you come from, where you've been. You say, I don't even have the Holy Ghost. Woo, that's even better. Because today's your day. You don't have to leave here without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you don't have to leave here without having the winner inside of you. The one that'll help us. The one that'll be patient. The one that'll be kind. The one that's, ooh, he sticks closer than a brother. He's our brother. And he loves us. Lift our hands and love him. Oh.